technical pieces of background information. Andy is uh, the head of the GIS uh, laboratory in Erie. Thank you, everyone. I have a very impertinent request um, at the beginning of this presentation. Um, I'm more than happy to share this presentation with anyone, so please save your camera batteries for Hanong Bay and other sightseeing around, uh, around Vietnam. Um, I'll be, I'm more than willing to, to give you a copy of this. After. I'll be happy to do so in an effort to disseminate some of our preliminary results and also to get feedback from different groups on how we can try and improve this analysis. So just to give you an idea of what I'll be talking about, I think David and Akim have introduced it quite well, um, trying to produce some quite rapid background assessments um, using spatial analysis to try and map out areas in Asia um, where rice is produced and the yield and the yield potentials. An awful lot of people have had an input into this process as well as the strategic assessment task force that David has mentioned. Um, a lot of people have contributed a lot of time and effort in, into producing these um, these, these preliminary assessments. So I'd just like to give acknowledgement to these people here. So this is the question that was posed by David. I, I joined IRI this time last year, and this was one of the first tasks I was faced with, was if we look at the rice growing areas across Asia, you know, what do we know about the cropping systems? What do we know about irrigation and rain fed? And you know, what do we think we know about the yields and what those yields may be in the future? And these are all questions that needed to be answered uh, as kind of a background analysis for this, for this assessment. So I split this into three separate tasks, uh, determining where and how rice is cultivated in Asia, trying to get an idea of the yields, the actual yields, now and what they may look like in the future, and then looking at rice potential yields under climate change. So the first step as David alluded to, was this whole concept of agroecologies. Uh, and we have an awful amount of, uh, a tremendous amount of information uh, on this uh, by people like Hugh and Hugh and others who have collated statistical information and had a lot of expert roundtables and, and discussions on, on how rice is cultivated across Asia. And this is something that we hoped we wanted to update. And after several rounds of discussions and several attempts to do this using other methods, we, we came back to this typology of what we wanted to, to try and use to describe the different rice systems across Asia. And we ended up with this eight-class typology, if you like, of, of the different rice systems. Um, four of them are essentially irrigated, and four of them are, are, are rain-fed systems. And we have everything from single-season irrigated uh, up to double and triple um, intensively irrigated rice systems. We have our rain-fed systems, again, single and double. Uh, we can look at rice cropped with another crop, uh, and of course the upland category. So these are our eight typologies that we're using. And this has some relation to the data produced by Huke and Huke, but it is still a slightly different way of looking at the agroecologies. And we had a lot of different data sources that we could use for this. Now, of course, expert opinion has a huge amount of um, input into this as well, but we also look back at all of the statistical publications out there, and you can see that there's a lot of information for us to try and um, collate and to try and standardize to come up with a common measure of, uh, of um, rice, uh, rice systems in Asia. So what we've done is to split Asia into 220 zones. We've gone down below the national level in terms of this assessment. And this splitting up of the region into zones is somehow a compromise between the available statistical information, um, the detail that we see in Hugh and Hugh, and somehow related to the actual physical distribution of rice growing areas. And then we had to try and review and revise these estimates uh, through an iterative process. Now these are the zones across Asia, and you can see it's, um, of course, areas like India and China have much larger zones than, than other countries, but in general we try to capture uh, a, a sub-national concept of, of rice cultivation and rice areas. And this is the biggest issue we had at the beginning, is that we have all the data on the left that comes in different formats and characterizes the rice systems in different ways, and it didn't really match the agroecology that, that, that we had conceived of as part of the roundtable discussions with the Strategic Assessment Task Force. And this has caused a uh, 
uh, us to, to review and revise this several times to try and come up with you know, how much rice is grown under each of these different agroecologies. And this has been uh, a major component of this background analysis. And this is what we came up with for Asia. And at the bottom, I've color-coded the different classifications, the different eight, the eight typologies. And essentially, the irrigated systems are in blue, and the, the rent-fed systems are in the orange and red. And if you just look at Asia in general, about 57% of the rice area is cultivated under irrigated conditions. And you can see there's quite an even split between the irrigated, the irrigated other, the double irrigated rice, and the triple irrigated rice systems. When we break that down and look at what's happening in South Asia, East Asia, and Southeast Asia, you see very different trends. I mean, evidently in East Asia, it's predominantly irrigated systems. Uh, in South Asia, it's more of a 50-50 split. Uh, in Southeast Asia, rain fed is still slightly dominant. Of course, we can break this down even further and go down to the country level. I don't want to spend too much time here, but this is one of the reasons why I'm really keen to disseminate this presentation after, because we would really like to get a lot of feedback on this and how we can try and improve these figures. Now, of course, we can disaggregate this even more and go down to our zones. And here, if we look at the distribution, and I'm just going to give two examples here. This is the irrigated rice other system. And each of these points represents about 25,000 hectares, and you can quite clearly see some of the rice wheat areas in the in IGP, IGP, and of course across China and other areas. So just to give you an idea of the kind of spatial detail we, we are trying to pull together here across these different agroecologies. Another example would be the upland or dryland rice system, and again you see a very different distribution. So this is what we're trying to pull together in this analysis. So that was the first component, trying to come up with a new system of defining rice agroecologies across Asia. And then that would form the basis for a lot of the other work that was going on in the strategic assessment. The second component of the background analysis is looking at actual rice yields and trying to estimate what the, um, what the yields are in 2010, like contemporary rice yields across Asia, at the same level of spatial detail. And then to look at the future yields. And if we you know, assume that what, we see in 20, what we've seen over the last few years is going to continue a kind of business-as-usual trend. That was really the only way we could conceive of, of kind of modeling actual yields. So we're trying to extrapolate what we've seen in subnational statistics out into the future. And of course, extrapolating out to 2010 is quite plausible. Extrapolating out to 20, 2035 is another question, but it's really the only approach that we could conceive of to do this in, in, a, in a quite a short space of time. So we went back to our rice time series data where um, IRI, along with its partners, has collected a huge amount of information over the years uh, from different countries on rice production area and yield statistics. And so we were able to go back sometimes 50 or 60 years to look at the trend um, in rice yield. And on the right, we see the number of zones where we had, that we uh, observed to each country. This is our kind of spatial disaggregation of this information. So how we go about doing this, and this is just an example from Bangladesh, looking back over 50 years of rice yields, and we see a lot of fluctuation from year to year, but we use um, a lowest method to um, smooth out that trend to just try and capture what has been the rice, the, the rice yield trend over the last 50 years. And then we use ARIMA forecasting models to extrapolate that out to 2010. Now, if we're lucky, we have current yields from maybe 2007, 2008, 2009, depending on how long it takes uh, for a country to publish these official statistics. So we still have to estimate 2010, and then we go ahead and estimate 2035. And just to give you an idea of what this looks like, this is an example from Andhra Pradesh uh, over 50 years. Uh, and this is showing in the gray line the actual yield reported in the statistics from year to year. The black line is showing our smooth trend, and then we have the extrapolation into the future uh, in red and with standard errors in blue. Another example from Haryana, we see a very different pattern in the historical time series, and the influence that change has on our projections out into the future. The standard errors become much wider because we've observed historical changes in the trend, and that means we have less confidence in projecting what that trend might be in the future. And again, starting at a continental level, these are the yield estimates 
for 2010 in tons per hectare. Uh, across all of Asia, about four and a half tons per hectare. Uh, I see variations when you look in South Asia and East Asia and Southeast Asia. Of course, East Asia having again the higher yield. South Asia and Southeast Asia slightly less. Projecting out to 2035, we generally see an increase of about one ton or so in 25 years. And if we were to assume that the area of production stays constant, that translates to a change in production of 630 million tons to 760 million tons in the future. Of course, we can disaggregate that and go back to our 220 zones and look at the actual yield estimates for, for 2010. Again, we see much higher yields in the, in the north, uh, particularly in northern China, and yields coming down to the 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 5 tons per hectare in other parts of Asia. Moving on to 2035, generally seeing substantial yield gains in different areas. I'm just going to flick back and forth between these two, just for a while, so you can focus on a particular area and observe the change. Translating that into a change in yield, tons per hectare, generally extrapolating the trends that we observe, we see the yield gains in most places, um, some of them substantial gains, two to four tons, sometimes higher. Other places, zero to one, one to two tons. There's quite a lot of spatial variation and what we've observed in the trend if we were to extrapolate that out. Now, as I mentioned before, in general, when we look at 2010, we seem to have plausible results, but there is no forecasting method in the world that is going to allow you to come up with you know, uh, reliable results at sub-national level 25 years in the future. We're just trying to do the best we can with the data and the information that's available. But we feel that the method's quite robust and it's making the most of what we have. Now the final step in this process was to look at potential yields. And again, David has alluded to this, and it's part of the process of computing yield gap estimates of the same kind of detail. And the way we've approached this is to use our Arisa 2000 crop growth model and climate data in order to generate potential yield estimates for 2010 and 2035. Now, Arisa 2000 requires daily climate data on a range of variables, rainfall, temperature, radiation, vapor pressure, and wind speed. And the only way for us to generate that is to downscale some of the results from the global climate modeling exercises that are going on. Now, downscaling, uh, it's a very computer-intensive process where you take these global models which are a very coarse spatial resolution and try to generate higher resolution climate data for your area of interest. And to do that, we had to split Asia into three regions. Now, each region takes about three months of processing on some fairly powerful computing facilities. Um, and that's three months if everything goes well. There are a lot of technical issues in doing this. And it has been somewhat unfortunate that uh, we know that many people are doing this exercise, but there has been a, somehow an unwillingness to share the information, which means that we've had to do a lot of this ourselves. Uh, again, these are the zones that we've looked at across Asia, where we split up the, into three zones for the, the climate modeling purposes. Now again, I want to acknowledge the Malaysian Meteorological Department for sharing their data with us. It's been invaluable. Uh, we've just finished the run of South Asia here at Erie, and the Hadley Met Center in the UK has been aiding us enormously with this, and they're running the model for China and uh, the rest of East Asia. And this is still ongoing. Now, as we know, there are many different global climate change models and many different scenarios, and it's simply impossible to try and downscale all of them. It's just too much work. So we chose one model. Uh, which is the Hadley CM3 model, and we chose one scenario, which is a kind of balanced emission scenario. And as it turns out, since we're really looking at the 2035, that's not a big time scale in terms of climate change modeling. And most of the divergence in scenarios occurs after that date, so the choice of scenario is actually not that critical in this case. 